Bienvenue à l'UGC pour euh, la masterclass de la présidente de notre jury. Je pense que vous avez tous euh, dû lire plusieurs fois que nous avions vraiment envie d'avoir une femme présidente du jury, une chouronneuse importante. Je veux dire, c'est vrai que ce n'est pas si facile que ça. Les chouronneuses du niveau international de Martin Noxon ne sont pas si nombreuses, donc elles travaillent énormément. Et donc, c'est toujours difficile pour elles de venir et de prendre 12 jours sur, sur leur temps de travail. Donc, on est extrêmement heureux d'avoir Martin Noxon comme présidente du jury. C'est une femme remarquable, en fait. Vous avez tous suivi, j'imagine, un peu sa carrière. Vous connaissez Buffy contre les vampires, les épisodes de Clay, de Grey's Anatomy, de Man Man qu'elle a écrite. On a tous, pour ceux qui l'ont vu, mais je vous encourage à le voir si vous ne l'avez pas vu, on a quelques épisodes que l'on reprend ici de sa série Sharp Object, dont elle est la choronneuse et qui passe sur OCS, qui nous a tous impressionnés. C'est une femme qui travaille beaucoup sur, justement, les femmes, et elle met à chaque fois en scène des femmes fortes et comme elle le dit elle-même, des femmes en colère. On va donc pouvoir assister à sa masterclass. Elle répondra bien sûr à vos questions. Et tout de suite, je vous demande d'accueillir Martin Noxon. Et je vous demande également maintenant d'accueillir Charlotte Bloom, journaliste OCS et qui animera cette rencontre. Merci Charlotte. Bon débat. Maintenant, c'est à vous Charlotte. Bonjour à tous. Euh, bah, comme vous le savez, on va parler en anglais. Hein? We're going to speak English. Yes. So I thought... That's very exciting. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it would be cool to start with a quote I, find, I found from Gillian Flynn, ah. <laughs> uh, because you adapted uh, our novel, Sharp Objects, uh, for television. And this is what she says about you. If you wonder, um, who, what is she hiding? <laughs> That's what she says. She says she is an amazing force wrapped in this calm, pleasant package. Also, don't fuck with her. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think that's more true now than ever. <laughs> I think that um, there were many times in my life when you could fuck with me, but you can't anymore. <laughs> What has changed? Um, you know, it's one of the, I was going to say one of the few, there are a lot of good things about getting older, but one of them is you sort of know yourself better and, and you know um, life is short, so you, you don't have time to be pleasant all the time. <laughs> Right answer. <laughs> so maybe you, should, you could start by telling us what made you want to become a storyteller? Um, well, the funny thing is I really didn't want to be a storyteller. I wanted to be an actress. And, um, and I was in all the school plays and you know I wanted to sing and dance. And, um, and then I went on a few professional auditions and I didn't want to do that any anymore. <laughs> um, and uh, and a, People had said in my childhood, you know, you're pretty good at writing. You should maybe think about being a writer. And I would always think, ew, who wants to do that? Like, what a, you know, that's like the lowest person on the totem pole. Um, but I, um, it, it was true that it was the one thing that I sort of showed an aptitude for. And um, but I went to film school, still trying to figure out what part. I knew I wanted to be you know, making making some kind of entertainment, but I didn't know where I fit, you know? And um, I went to film school and to get uh, my, to graduate, I had to either make a movie or, um, or write a screenplay and I didn't have enough money for film. I would have made a movie, but I didn't have the money, so I wrote a screenplay because paper is cheap. And um, when I graduated a couple years later, um, I showed it to somebody and they showed it to somebody and it actually was optioned to you know, be made. And then I thought, well, I guess this is what I'm going to do. <laughs> and I didn't love it for a long time. It was hard. It was you were doing it against your own will? No, I was taking classes and, but I didn't, I would sit down to write and I would feel dread, you know, I'd feel, and I'd feel the voice in my head always saying like, oh, that's not good enough. And, you know, who do you think you are? And, you know, rewrite, rewrite, rewrite. And I'd, I wouldn't even move forward in the script. I wouldn't finish a first draft because I'd rewrite and rewrite the fa same 30 pages. And then finally I'd finish it. Um, and, you know, that's not fun. <laughs> 
Um, so, but, and then I remember by the time I got my first, my first big job on Buffy, something had shifted. And it was only after it shifted, you know, from writing, I think I was writing to sell, to make money and to have a career. And then when I finally started thinking, you know, maybe that's never gonna happen. Maybe I'm just gonna, maybe I'll go back to school. You know, like many writers, I thought I could be a therapist. I could be a shrink, because we understand the human condition. Um, and, uh, and I started to look into schools, and I finally had this sort of moment when I thought, I really, now I don't want to do anything else. And, um, and so I thought, well, maybe I should write just things I wish that I could see and just write to please myself for a while and see what that's like. Like, um, you know, take the, take the jury out of my head and just write to please myself and, um, and about things that I'm interested in. And so I started writing stage plays. And, um, and that's when things changed. Um, and, and I started, you know, I wrote stage plays and some, um, some spec scripts, you know, spec scripts are scripts you write um, that you don't expect to get made, but they're a sample of your work. And those were the two, the play and the spec were the two samples that got me my job on Buffy. So it was really kind of like this mental shift happened and then I, was, and then I started working. How long did it take from the moment you thought, okay, maybe I should try, and okay, I'm doing I mean, it for it, real? I mean, it was crazy. It was a, about a year. Yeah, it was crazy. But I had been writing for, by that time, I'd been writing for, you know, seven, eight years. I, I got a job as a director's assistant, and he actually helped me get a script when I first started, you know, write, you know working in the business. Um, on the show that I was working on. So I actually have a credit from way before I started working. And then I didn't sell another thing for seven years. And that was that period where I was just struggling. And um, I thought, wow, I got this head start. And then it just petered out and died. Um, so that's the long answer to that question. That's very much uh, a representation of how hard it is to if it's what you want and if it's your dream, how hard you have to work and to keep going. And I read that you always thought that uh, for Jen G. Cohan, Weeds was like her 13th pilot. Yeah. And yeah. like, okay, I have to do 12 at least. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, and it wasn't until the last six years that I started creating shows. I was always um, a really good second lieutenant. I was always a really good, you know, um, assistant to the, the the top writer, and I think that was another time when I had to turn another corner. And and I think for me, um, there was a lot of fear involved in being the the the, the boss, yeah. you know, because if you're the boss, then you also you may take the credit, but you also take the blame. And I think I again that this goes back to what we were talking about before, like the part of me that that cared about what other people thought didn't want to take that chance. And then when I became willing to fail, I was like, okay, if it's a miserable disaster, I'll, I'll survive, you know. I won't be happy, but I'll survive. <laughs> I think you survived. <laughs> I've survived, yeah, so far so good, you know. Uh, um, I'd like to watch a first clip that might surprise a little bit, but uh, I think it would be interesting to talk about uh, Jules. It's a clip film, please, thank you. So why did I pick this clip? <laughs> why did you, because I talk about, I think, because I talk about um, Poltergeist as being an inspiration. Um, because when I was working on Fright Night, um, uh, one of the producers, Mike DeLuca, said to me, I really believe in a first act. And that was something that at that time really wasn't in fashion. Um, maybe why the movie didn't do so well. but um, but. You know, the Spielberg school of horror, you know, when he did frightening films like Jaws or, or you know, he was very involved in um, Poltergeist was this idea that you have to learn to love the characters before you can feel fear, real fear for them. And um, I went back and looked at some of those movies and it's true, he takes his time with getting to know these people. And I remember you had one impression of the parents and then you see this scene and you go, oh, they're people. 
you know, and they're, they get stoned. Yeah, they get stoned, <laughs> they make fun of themselves, you know, they, they love each other. And then all the stuff that comes after, I was much more compelling because you, there's real stakes to the family. So um, I always, you know, when I'm talking about how to, how to, to write a different kind of horror film that isn't just about, you know, gore, but really about being invested in the characters, that's a great example. So genre fictions is something you're very attracted to, attached to. What do you think it brings to a fiction to be supernatural or sci-fi or to belong to a specific genre? Well, I mean, you know, there's there's two things. One that you can write about a topic without writing, you know, specifically about it in the same way. I mean, obviously, Buffy used metaphor, metaphorical monsters, and um, you know, and. I think when I was younger, I didn't really understand why I loved it so much. And the other part, I think, is that we all really long for an unseen world. We just want so badly to believe there's another dimension or another life. And I think that there's something very human that's expressed in, in genre material, that almost always the characters, even if they're zombies, they have a life after death. You know, there's this idea that there's so much more than we see. So I've always sort of, you know, I think, um, I get a little obsessed about mortality. <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> Can we escape it? Well, because no. like, you know, life is like this movie, except you don't know what the third act is. You never get to know, you know, I mean, nobody, that's why we long for people to come back and say, oh, this is what happens at the end. <laughs> yeah. So Buffy, to me, is like the, a huge sum up of everything Martin Oxen. Uh, it's death, mortality, anger, women, feminism, learning to know yourself, learning to use your power, especially if you're a woman and you haven't been told you could have power. So it seems so obvious that this <laughs> is where everything started for you. Can you tell us a bit about this experience? Um, well, it was funny because uh, I lived in Los Angeles. I've lived there most of my life because I was born there. and. Um, I was driving, I remember, I'll never forget, I was driving um, someplace and there was a big billboard for the show, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, it was the season one. And I thought, oh, what a terrible idea, like a failed movie, um, it looks so corny, ugh, bleh, you know. And then um, by that time I managed to get an agent and she called and said, you know, um, they read your material at Buffy, they'd really like to meet you. And I was like, mm, really? And she said, no, 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 you have to watch the show. You have to watch, it's, it's better than it sounds. You know, don't ignore the movie, just, you know, watch the show. So she sent over the first um, season, which I think it was just 13 episodes. And um, I remember, and this is back in the old days when you put in the tape, you know, and I remember, um, I'll, I, again, like these are these memories that are lodged here, but, um, they got to the, the episode where um, Buffy and Angel are having this fight and she, you know, and he says, you know, are you afraid of me? And, you know, you should be afraid of me. You should be scared of me. And she bares her neck and she says, D you know, do it. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> I was like, I am so in because she was the hero, but she was still a teenage girl. She was acting irrationally, like she was acting crazy. And I thought, how great she gets to be the hero of the story, but she also gets to be really flawed and and irrational. Um, and you know, then by the end of the ep you know the end of the thirteen, I was just <gasps> calling my agent, going, get me in there. <laughs> Yeah. And then I had an offer from another show, which I took because Buffy wasn't picked up yet. They hadn't officially said they'd do more. And I'm sitting, I was an assistant, I'm sitting at my desk and my phone rings and I pick it up and it's like, hi, this is Joss Whedon. And I, I was like, oh God. And he said, um, what are you doing? Don't you want to be a better writer? And I thought, wow, the ball's on this guy. But I thought, I do. I want to be a better writer. So I turned the other job down and, and went. What did you learn with him then? How, how did he make you a better writer? Even though I'm sure you were a good writer already. I was OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, you know, there's so much that I didn't know about um, about storytelling, um, especially in this longer format. I'd written spec. You know, I'd written single episodes, but I'd never written a whole arc of a of a season. You know, and a, and thinking, you know, the way he would come in and and know sort of 
important points along the way and really have a concept for the whole season and then guide it, you know, that alone was, you know, a revelation. And then, you know, he really has such a great way of melding humor into his um, his work, and I'd never thought of myself. And I, I, you know, I think that you'll look at my episodes and see that they're generally the more dramatic or melodramatic. Um, but I feel like I learned a lot about humor and a lot about subverting expectations, like setting up a, a moment where you think one thing's gonna happen and then the exact opposite happens, like ways to, to lean into the genre conventions especially in horror or you know fantasy to to set up the thing and then have the thing totally not happen, you know um, so I have some so many things break the rules pardon break the rules yeah yeah uh, now we know that buffy became such an important show for guidance for the viewers to learn about themselves, to evolve, to feel better, to feel less lonely but did you know while writing while working there what it meant, and if not, when did you d discover it, and how did you feel? No, it was a strange, you know, it was a strange experience for all of us because the show was popular, but then I feel like in seasons two and three it got really popular, and you know, all of a sudden Sarah Michelle Gellar was on the cover of Rolling Stone, and you know, the, the all the the kids, you know, the young people on the show were getting really famous, and um, and and it was right at the beginning of people on the internet you know, creating forums for themselves to talk about the show. And we had a really active forum. And then they started having a party. And when it first started, this is sort of before the big comic conventions and all that. But at all, that was all beginning. Um, and they would have these little parties and we would go, you know, like it was just this sort of like, hey, nice to meet you. But people were really, Emotional, and then you know, you a couple years later, we're going to Comic Con, and it's like walking with Joss was like walking with Elvis. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you walk through the Comic Con, and they have bodyguards, and I'm like, what is happening? But but the the thing I remember the most is that after the sort of whole Willow storyline, with her with with first with Oz and then with Tara, that was incredibly meaningful for people, and that's when I really started to realize that. The show is having this this impact because people would come up to me and say, you know, my daughter came out to me after after this, and you know, it was part of the way we understood each other was through watching the show, and incredible, incredible things like that, and 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 yes, and a lot of people who just always felt like they were the only ones who felt like they were weirdos, and then you're like, oh no. <laughs> Is it a kind of a moment where you thought, whatever I do, this is what I want to infuse in it. I want to keep showing things people don't show, talking about subjects and themes people don't talk about. Yeah, I, I think it, I was so um, lucky and, and, and it was very difficult leaving that show and finding my way. I, I feel like for a lot of the writers, you'll if you look, you see that we have this sort of fallow period after we left Buffy where you know, we might try different things, but then it, like five, five, six years later, everybody started finding their way. But it was such a, um, a great match for, for so many of us. And it's not easy to find that match. You know, it's not easy to find a show where you can really flourish creatively and have it be a commercial success, you know. Did you feel a kind of a baby blues moment? Did I feel what? A baby blues moment? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But then I had real babies and I knew the, what a real baby blues. <laughs> <laughs> Which one do you prefer? <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, I mean, uh, well. <laughs> uh, maybe we could watch a, a Buffy clip. Oh, maybe that we could. That would be cool. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Okay, so darkness, <laughs> <laughs> mm. allowing a teen drama to have real, raw darkness. How yeah, yeah. freeing is that? Oh, it was super, super fun. Like the whole Bad Willow thing, I, was, I, I had a field day. <laughs> Um, it's so funny because I go hiking and I hike right through where that scene was filmed. Oh, is the body still there? Oh yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah the body's still there. Um, but no, I, so I think about that scene all, all the time. I'm like, oh yeah, he was strung right, right between these two trees. Um, yeah, no, it, it, the, but 
I think that, again, was such wish, wish fulfillment because Willow's such a nice girl. And I feel like, don't we all kind of wish that we could just abandon all of that and punish the people who deserve to be punished and you know, not, have, not have the restraints, especially women? Because I think part of the reason why you know, so many dark shows are so successful for, for female audiences, and it's, at least in the States, it's true that you, th you would think that the, the like, top 10 shows wouldn't necessarily be the most gruesome, but a lot of them are. And I think, you know, there's a, a, a sense of a lack of power that we have, you know, and, and somehow women being able to, um, to flay a guy, <laughs> um, but also to solve a crime, to, you know, all these things that, that feel like there's a lot of bad in the world and we can feel really powerless around that. So, um, yeah, it was good fun. F female anger is an element we can find all along your career. <laughs> uh, we'll see Diet Lynn later or yeah. Sharp Objects, but yeah. there is a... We always need characters to help us get free as viewers. Yeah. And when we see angry women, we understand we are allowed to be angry ourselves. So I was wondering if this is something you care about because it was something you lacked when you were a viewer, a younger viewer, and you thought, uh, who can I be as a woman? It's interesting. I haven't really thought about it that way. But I think, you know, definitely growing up, you know, women were usually shown as either comedic foils they were they were the sort of jokers or, or the brunt of a joke or they were perfect you know they were which we are probably, yeah, which we are but you know um uh and and i couldn't relate to that and it, it definitely set me up for a lifetime of thinking that i was supposed to look a certain way act a certain way you know, um, I already had that in my nature, but then to have it affirmed over and over again, like this is what this looks like, this is what femininity looks like, um, with very few exceptions. Um, and to me, you know, anger is still one of the, the feelings that I have the hardest time accessing unless I'm writing it, you know? <laughs> and then all of a sudden I can kind of like untangle it. Um, so I think that, that um, it, it's it, for me. It's very cathartic. It it happens there more in my life than it does in my life. You know, it's very relieving being angry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I I feel like when you watch everything you worked on, uh, whether it's your own shows or shows with somebody else, there is a real coherence in your choices, which mm. is very rare because even though you you might find different genres and areas, there's always something in common, uh, or few things in common, t what do you think those are that you always try to get in what you do? Um, I think, you know, I'm very, very drawn to stories of people that might feel unseen in some way. Um, I'm really drawn to the outsider. Um, you know, I'm drawn to uh, people at these moments of identity, you know, some kind of identity crisis. Um, so for me, you know, digging into particularly female characters, but, you know, when I write male characters, I approach them the same way. Like, what is their perception of their deficit, you know, and what is it truly? What, you know, because I don't think we often see ourselves as clearly as we think we do. And then the other thing I always joke is that I, I always think a great place to start any story is somebody who's fully committed, wholly committed to a really bad plan. <laughs> that they have, they have like, they've got, they do have a plan and they think it's the right thing to do and that's the beginning of the story is that, you know, whatever they think is going to happen is not going to happen. <laughs> and how do you work with other writers? What do your writer's room look like, feel like? Is it like a big group therapy? Uh, do you fight a lot with the right? What do you expect from them? How do you work with them? I'm just a slave driver. I'm I mean, no, um, I was so lucky because my first writer's room was not not driven by ego. He knew that he was a good writer. He felt that he, and he had had success as a film writer. Doing Buffy was a choice for him. So the worst writer's rooms I've been in are the ones where the people in power are actually sort of afraid of other people doing good work because it says, it says something about them. It says, if, if I give a new writer a script or somebody else a script and they write really well, maybe they're better than me. 
So there's a there's a, a psychological drama that goes on where they're punished a little bit. You know, you have to feel like um, you can never do it right. Somehow you always fail, even if you haven't failed, you always fail. Um, and I've been in those rooms, you know, as a as a staff writer and. But because I had worked with Joss and I saw, I, I kind of identified ego as the enemy of good, you know? Um, I was, I've been very fortunate when I run a room to feel like the, the best atmosphere for the best outcome is that there aren't any mistakes. You know, you, you have a, you can, um, and, and certainly there are times when a writer doesn't work out or over the course of time you say like, hey, I need to, pull you aside and we should talk about this. You know, this is a, we're having this problem or, um, but I don't like to foment drama. I don't like, um, I don't feel like the drama has to happen in the room for it to happen on the page, you know? Um, and I, and I also really hope to bring people to a point where they feel really empowered to, to do good work. So it's pretty happy usually. I hate to say it. <laughs> I mean, I like to, to say yeah. it. Hire us, please. Pardon? Hire us. Yeah. <laughs> You have, I think, a few good writers in this room. <laughs> uh, I read that when you look for your next project, one of your rules is, I will take what I'm scared of, what scares mm. me. I said that, really? Yes, oh. you did. Mm. I could show you the clip. <laughs> is it true? Is it, do you look for like the next challenge rather than the next, I know I'm going to do it yeah, well, whatever? I, th I think I do in the sense that, um, you know, like, one of my dreams is to write a musical. Um, and uh, I've been thinking, you know, for the stage. And one of the things I realize really appeals to me is I've never done it before. Um, and there's something, and I, and I, again, you know, it reminds me of that, what I saw with Joss, where he would direct an episode and really figure that out. And then he'd add another element of difficulty. You know, let's take away sound. You know, okay, here's the one, um, let's, do it with, you know, or like take away dialogue. Let's do it this time, you know, it's gonna be cinema verte. Okay, this time it's gonna be a musical, you know, this time. So he kept sort of changing the rules so he could, he could learn something new. And I think that, you know, one of the things, I always look at other people's careers and I wonder why did they kind of lose the, the zhuzh, you know, why did they lose um, their voice in a way? And there's two things, one I think, you you start to feel immune to criticism. You don't really take in when people say well, this isn't working. You know you get very defensive. Um, you see that with book authors, like their first book has it had a really good editor, and then they just get thicker and thicker, and you're like, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I feel like that's one thing. And the other thing is, um, you know, that the, this idea that you stop learning, that, that you know people may feel like, well, I've got that. So I think. I am. I'm always really tempted to try another level of difficulty. Yeah. Was directing doing that? Because you've directed a few episodes of Buffy, some Dietland episodes, a movie to the bone. Yeah. Uh, was it like, OK, this is going to be scary enough. Let's try. <laughs> or was it like a deep desire you had? It was it was a desire that grew out of being a feature writer um, and 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 to some degree a, a showrunner and and having the lost in translation moment between writing and then what happened on the screen and but also in in um, in Hollywood film writers are just replaced all the time you just you so it's like you work so hard on this project. And I had an experience once where I wrote the screenplay for a, a very beloved novel, and the, fir and the first reaction to the screenplay was, oh my gosh, I loved it. We're the, and then they had, a, they had a big star attached, and she loved it, and she came on to the project because of it, and she sent me a note, and I was like, wow, you know, because I worked really hard. And, um, and then a bunch of directors came in, and they were like, this isn't dark enough. It's not that, you know, they, nobody, nobody loved it. And when they finally found someone who would do it, they, he brought his own writer. And when the movie came out, you know, it wasn't a success. And I'm not saying that I, I, I always think that I'm right, but the tone of the movie was very dark and serious. And that's not the tone of the book, you know? And I was like, why? You know, it would be very easy with that material because it was based on it's it was based on the Glass Castle, which is a novel, an American novel that's very um, that's about a, a really traumatic childhood, but with really um, charismatic parents and a really um, you know half adventure, half 
abuse almost like but the childhood had this kind of wild quality that was kind of wonderful too and there was a lot of love in the book and i wanted it so badly to have that love too and to have the the fun and the sort of wildness of childhood and not be and i kept thinking about like james brooks um, back when he made Terms of Endearment, that that's a tragic story, but it's fun. It has love in it, you know? And, um, and, uh, and after that, I thought, you know, the guy who got this movie to direct had really only made one notable film. And uh, I'm going to take it. <laughs> and, and, and I thought, well, you know, it seems impossible, but maybe the next step is for me to to really try directing again, because um, because I, I just got so tired of making these, you know, it's like you, you talk about baby blues, that's the worst baby blues, is, is you spend six months or sometimes a year writing a script that you, you learn to love and feels like your baby, and then they take it away from you and say, bye, you'll never see it again. You know, and it's not like you wanted that to happen. It's not an adoption, it's like, oh, oh, oh. oh. And then you get to see it all grown up, raised by somebody else. <laughs> yeah, that's a very hurtful metaphor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think maybe we could watch a clip from uh, Mad Men and talk oh. about it. Oh. Ooh. Maybe you should send her. Maybe we should. <laughs> maybe that's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> So I think it's cre really obvious <laughs> why <laughs> this scene exists. Yeah. And with with Mad Men or with Unreal, you you talk about giving women power and stop being afraid of it. Nothing yeah. will happen. The end of the world will not come. I mean, we can just do well, and that's it. Yeah. Uh, how important is that for you to to show that power can be feminine as well? Um, well, it's funny because I feel like now, you know, in a in a way, like Buffy was the ultimate empowered woman. Um, but in a way, I'm I part of the reason I love Mad Men so much was because those characters were all really really flawed, you know. And to me, like the next stage in writing strong, quote unquote, strong women is showing women who you have a lot of issues just like anybody else, but then, but can also continue to achieve, you know? And um, I think part, part of the problem has been this idea of like a strong female lead, which, which became almost this cliche of being consistently right or consistently, you know, or a sort of cliched flaw, you know? <laughs> like, like, oh, I'm quirky, or, you know, I, oh, I fall in love with boys too much, you know? Oops, I tripped, you know? <laughs> um, and to me, like th th part of what I loved about Peggy was she's hardly perfect, you know, um, but yeah, she does deserve her ch her chance. And um, in Unreal, I mean, they're despicable, they're terrible people, um, but at the same time, you know, they're very competent. Um, and to me, that was incredibly freeing to write these characters who are doing something that I I find per personally, I find the the message of that kind of reality television to be repulsive. Um, and they're not introspective about it at all. <laughs> um, and that was very freeing to get to write these characters who are really competent, but I wouldn't want the power that they have. You know, I think the, they didn't have the power of, of um, self, uh, self examination. <laughs> yeah, because money was in, in the way. Yeah, and, and, and delusion, like they both, um, those characters, at least in season one, um, you know, I think they both, like Rachel saw herself as trapped when she really wasn't, you know, and, and all of the, 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 the what, what really held those two women t together, I think, was their relationship. And finding someone who can bear with you. Yeah, yeah. Because not many women will bear with Quinn. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Another very important uh, theme of your work, which is, I think, very uh, freeing, for, especially for women, is uh, the relation we have with our bodies, uh, the fear, the shame, the repulsion, the pressure, the, the questions of, do I look good enough? Is my body normal? Uh, who am I? Is my body the reflection of what I feel and everything? And it's in 
all of your work from from diet land to to the bone to sharp object and uh, then I will show a, a piece of, of diet land but I wanted to talk about this team because it's it's very important yeah I mean I for me it's been a lifelong struggle um, you know the somewhere very young I got the the idea that um, that being loved was contingent on th this, um, com almost completely. The, it, that my personality and my, what I had to offer was a, a secondary to, you know, the, the presentation. Um, and you know, I've struggled with that my whole life, and I'm, I don't think I'm alone um, in that. I think that um, you know, not just as use of weight, but but um, but presenting a self that is is lovable um, and acceptable and. Um, and and for me, you know, looking at it from all sides has really been important to try to free myself. You know, that's an area of writing that I think I, I write to try to free my own mind, um, to keep reminding myself of, um, you know, that that there's a, a whole other story. But it, you know, it's I wish I could say that it's it's something I've untangled, but I I still struggle. You know. Is this a, a theme or an idea that is hard to sell to networks, broadcaster, to say I'm going to write a show about a woman hurting herself, about a fat lady, about people that are on the street every day but that we don't show on television? Is it hard to sell? You know, um, what was interesting is when, you know, if you're going to see a clip from Dietland, um, it's based on a novel that... Um, that was pretty, um, it's a little bit like Fight Club for women. Um, it's, a, it's a really angry book, but the timing was perfect to sell it. it might, I don't think it was perfect when it came, came out. I think people were starting to get fatigued with serious, you know, The Handmaid's Tale was, um, was sort of came out the year before. And I feel like after that, people were like, ah, <laughs> you know, like Enough women. women. Women get abused. Bad things happen. Um, you know, and and the show isn't just about the body. It's about the way um, women's bodies are exploited, and and a lot of the characters in the in the story are you know survivors of abuse, survivors of rape, and you know that's an, another part of you know the work that I've done, which is you know um, women's women's issues. The, there's been this sort of um, almost false perception of progress because of the economy and the way that women have been pushed into the workforce. Um, it feels to me that women often feel more empowered, but when you start to look at where they are in positions of power, things haven't changed that much. There's a lot more women in companies, but not that many women in Hollywood or any place else who are actually the final word. You know, the, the, the majority of the people who, you know, it all comes down to money, you know, and, and the majority of the wealthiest people in the world are men. And almost all of them are white men. Um, and really, if we're talking about power, we need the keys to the kingdom, right? So I started thinking like, wow, we've come so far, baby, but we still have this really clear idea of ourselves as second class citizens. And in some ways that we don't even question, we don't even think about it. And um, so when Trump was run running for president and he would say these things and I would think, well, the women aren't gonna vote for him. It's just not gonna happen. Like he's, he's, he's the, man, the man we try to keep our daughters away from. So you wouldn't make him president. And then he became president. And I thought, oh my God, women, must have taken inside, they must have eaten this self-loathing to the place where they need a strong man, they need someone they think is gonna bully other people to keep them safe. And then came this book where I was like, oh, women take up arms in this book. They're the ones who are the, 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 um, the terrorists. And I thought, and there's a moment when I was reading the book, I thought, why don't we? Why have we never thought of Why that? Why don't we? You know, when three women a day in, in the United States die from domestic abuse, when, you know, um, you know, when rape and, and, you know, sexual assault, they're down, it is down, which I didn't know until I did the show. But, you know, but, but, but sort of the everyday of it. So it, it happened at this moment when those questions were really, um, being discussed, and so we sold it like that. But then they put it on television, and they were like, "What do we do with this?" Like, 
<laughs> so I was really angry, and these women killed these men. And um, so, yeah, commercially. But but it was interesting because Sharp was easy to sell um, because it's you know this successful author. Um, and I don't think I don't think that a lot of the people who bought it or made it understood what they were making. I had to tell them. They'd be like, why would anybody want to see this? It's so, I had men on the show say to me, you know, people who were really creatively involved, we went out to dinner one night and someone said, let me ask you, like, why, why, why do you think w women would want to see this? There's, what's the wish fulfillment? And I said, okay. <clears throat> you know? um, and I said, okay, here's the story of a woman who's abused herself because of secrets in her past. She's killing herself. And then she goes on this journey and seeks the truth and discovers the truth that it's not her, it's them. It, it really happened, you know? And I was like, I don't think you understand what wish fulfillment that is. And not just that you see the truth, everybody sees the truth. It's incredible. <laughs> and he was like, oh, I never thought of it that way. <laughs> So um, that one, I think we kind of slipped by them. Um, and then to the bone, we made by the skin of our teeth, you know? Um, and and it, it's really been gratifying because there's not, um, there's very few feature films made about eating disorders, which are, again, incredibly prevalent. You know, I had one um, that was, you know, really almost killed me, which is what the movie was about. And um, but also I had a hopeful experience because I recovered. Um, and then I started doing my research and, and it's, it's epidemic all over the world, still. Um, and when we first show, showed it to, I showed it to a producer who'd made a movie um, you know, called Whiplash and he said to me, um, it's just too small a topic. And I wish I had said, oh, so a, a really talented jazz drummer who has a mean teacher is really universal. You can win an Oscar for that. Um, so, uh, so he passed, but we found a female producer who, who found the money, sort of, and then we lost the money while we were making the movie, and then we got it again after the movie was made, and we, but we, um, so it was just difficult. But then we took it to Sundance, and um, Netflix bought it. They bought it for $8 million, and then it's one of the most successful films they've had. And it, you know, it's not the top because you know that's like um, it would be too much to hope for. But it, it's been successful, and not just successful in the U.S. It's been successful all over the world because there's not enough about these issues. They're not small issues. Things that happen more to women than men are not small issues. And it's not just rape. <laughs> you know, everybody thinks, oh, it's a woman's movie. It's a oh, rape, you know, or child abuse. And you're like, no, you know, we have other things. <laughs> other things happen. We do things to ourselves. Yeah, we do. And this clip of Diet Lane will prove it. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. So this is the first scene of the first episode of Diet Land, yeah. and this is how straight in your face it is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty in your face. Oh, it makes me emotional to see that because, you know, that was one of the cases where we weren't done telling that story. So it's hard. And I love this actress so much. She's amazing. Um, you know, we'll find something else to do. <laughs> Please. Yeah, yeah. But there is, uh, there is many things in this very small scene. There is almost <laughs> everything we talked about for an hour, yeah. which is, yeah, yeah, many problems to be talked about. And I was wondering if, first of all, you have any idea of how important uh, your stories are to people because they are very helpful and they are friends mm -hmm. to us. And if you do, how would you feel about it? Is it a big responsibility? No, 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 no. But how do you feel about that, knowing that? Um, you know, I, uh, yeah, you made me emotional. Um, uh, that's all I want, you know, that's why I do what I do. Because um, I need a friend, you know, I need, I need to know that we're connected. Um, that you know, that little girl who's still inside me, who's the weirdo, who doesn't know that other people feel the same way, you know, I, I also f feel like um, that's one of the reasons why I love Camille. She made proof. She found proof. And when I write, it's proof for me 
that we do matter. You know, um, if other people connect with these things, that these stories I'm telling, um, that means that we matter, that we've been seen. Um, so it really um, it moves me to think that that people that they're people's friends because that's what saved my life. You know, when I was little, and I would read books or or watch movies, and I think, oh, you know, I'm I'm not alone. Um, and it's this universal thing we wish for. And I think without art, without these stories, we'd be lost. You know. Get out of here. No, I'm too okay. <laughs> <laughs> Finn, <Sorry. laughs> uh, I think we have time for one last clip, and it's a it's a it's a very short clip. I love from uh, from Sharp Object. It's a dialogue between Camille and Adora. <laughs> oh. I hope that's some comfort to you. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I never yeah. loved you. Oh. My daughter. I think that's pretty. Str that's pretty much straight out of the book. Um, that that scene, though, when I read it, I remember thinking, "Oh, you know, um, just when she, just when you think, you know, Adora's gonna is gonna um, really connect with her, um, she's just uh, she's just heartless. She's a heartless person." <laughs> How many Makes me laugh. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> How many years did it take us to be able to see in a TV show a mother telling a daughter, I don't love you? And showing how complex uh, women are and that, yeah, mother too. Mothers can well, be... Uh, I mean, I will, I will say back, like, it, it, it would feel... Prog it, it, it could be progressive, but she is a murderer. I mean, she's pretty bad. So there's something in the genre. Don't you feel like the bad mom is part of the horror genre? Like the yeah, like but in this scene, she looks so nice. And like you said, oh, yeah. we, when the scene starts, you're like, oh, oh she's yeah. gonna be sweet. And yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's true. We did do that little like turn because we talked about that. Like we wanted to, you know, and I'm not sure that the scene was as built out in the book. Um, you know, we definitely sort of like played the game a little bit more of like, come here, come here, come here. We all know that family game, right? Like, oh no, I'm safe right now. And then, no, <laughs> yeah. What did you like uh, in this story? What made you want to, to adapt it? Um, well, we talked about Camille, um, but also um, genre-wise, you know, I've been very lucky. I like to jump around. And um, I'd never done uh, uh, a murder story. I'd never done, um, and I don't know. I'm always getting older, you know. Like the 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 the, um, the purview of the middle-aged woman is a, is getting into true crime and gross, you know, criminal stories. <laughs> but I suddenly got really interested, and in, and in after I read Gone Girl, that started me um, reading true crime and murder mysteries and things that I'd never been that into. I'd never been into suspense. Um, so there was a lot of, um, of of that. But the other part of it was, um, you know, I've also, you know, when we talk about the body and we talk about um, perfection and trying so hard to be lovable, um, you know, my relief from that was either eating or not eating or drinking or not drinking. So I've struggled with addiction my whole life. You know, when I, when I, sort of emerged from my eating disorder, I treated it for a while with, with alcoholism. And then I was sober for a really long time. And then while I was making this, I was struggling to get sober again. I, I started drinking again after 24 years of n nothing. And, um, and I thought it was a good idea. I thought, why not? And so it was bad when I was really young, but um, so I tried it again and almost immediately it was a problem, like from the first day. And um, so almost as soon as I started drinking, I started trying to stop again. And I thought this project kind of represented self-harm, you know, and w if I could write about, you know, that feeling of why, why is Camille doing this? You know, and, and for me it was, there was, a, there was a, a lot of ugliness inside of her that she wouldn't, admit to or talk to talk about and somehow that sort of search for the truth was part of her you know i believe she gets better after this um 
you know, that, that knowing what it, what is was helpful to her. So there was something in that too, in the, in the alcoholism. And there are a couple of things in the show that I wrote straight out of my own life. And when Jean-Marc first read the scripts, he said, you know, cause in the first episode she goes to a bar, she gets really drunk and she gets in her car and she's listening to music. And like, then you cut to the morning and she's falling asleep in her car. And that happened to me. And I, um, I, yeah, I, I was at a, bar and I, I went to my car and I was parked on this big busy street and all, all I remember is thinking like I'll just close my eyes for a second and then I woke up you know four hours later in in the light and um, you know with my keys in my hand and the car unlocked and I just thought I mean disaster um, so but he's this feels very truthful <laughs> And I was like, mm, you yeah. um, know. And I'm sober again for three years, so um, uh, thank God, right? <laughs> um, but I think that, that writing this in a way was really helpful. It helped me st see how she was trying to navigate, you know, whether she knew it or not, that, that, that this search for truth was, was part of her, her healing. So it's not only helpful to the viewers, but also to the writers. Yeah. Oh, yeah, <laughs> for sure. Uh, that would be my last question, and I know it's tricky, and I'm sorry. Uh, you started this business uh, 20 years ago. Everything has changed uh, in the writing, in what we dare showing, in what we dare selling to channels. Every channel has changed. What is to you the biggest change, and what, it, what change makes you the happiest? I mean, the thing that makes me the happiest is that all this opportunity um, that's come from um, streaming and um, and you know more channels and more ways of getting the work out is that um, you know what what used to be considered niche or or too small for a show is now um, is now something you can actually um, pursue as an idea and 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 just a globalization I think and this uh, this awareness that that the world is is, is getting to know each other um, you know there's an audience for so much more than people thought there was and people like me who've been writing about women and 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 odd characters and and um it felt like um i had always wanted to do that but nobody wanted it and you know even selling girlfriend's guide to divorce which was six years ago that was a hard show to get on the air because it was too racy yeah because they were like divorce mm. um, and now it feels old-fashioned so things are moving very quickly but i feel like you will never be able to put the genie back in the bottle you know that reminds me of a quote I read about you from Jason Bloom, and he said, what is cool now and what is like the zeitgeist today is what she's been writing for many years, but it's just that the society has caught up with her. Okay. They were late, and she was in advance. Now I'm going to have to run ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to start writing about like amoebas or a uh, aliens or something. Cause, but that's the other thing is it's so exciting to see all these incredible people you know, have a chance to you know, work in film and television, who just didn't have the entree, they didn't have a way in. You know, you see someone like Donald Glover, who's making Atlanta, which is you know such a specific, small piece of piece of the world, but just excelling. And then someone like Jordan Peele or Lena Waith, or you know, I'm thinking of all these women of you know women of color making shows, and um, you just. Of course, their stories are great. It's they've been. We've all been waiting, you know, to tell our stories. There we are. Voila. <laughs> Voila. <laughs>